All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Discovering Multifamily. I'm your host, Anthony Scandariato with Red Knight Properties. And today we have a very special guest here with us, uh, Greg Dickerson, uh, who is a serial entrepreneur and uh, a real estate developer as well, uh, a coach and a mentor. And uh, Greg has bought, developed, sold over $250 million worth of real estate, um, built and renovated hundreds of custom homes and commercial buildings. Um, developed, you know, residential and mixed-use communities, and started 12 different companies from the ground up. and And now, a lot of the time, he is focusing on uh, mentoring, um, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, different real estate investors all across the country, and helping them grow and scale their business. Whether it's raising more capital to do bigger deals, or um, you know, it, you know, any aspect of their business, whether a leadership team, um, and you know, he advises. Um, some some clients that he can kind of kind of talk about, and uh, definitely want to hear Greg's story and um, you know how he can really help you know 10x uh, a business in a very short amount of time. And and uh, you know thanks for coming on the show, Greg. Really appreciate it. Hey Anthony, thanks for having me. Yeah, the 10x. Yeah, Grant Cardone and I talked about that uh, Monday last week. We uh, <laughs> we did that interview and talked about exactly how to 10x his business. You know, in the next year. Awesome. Well, we'd love to hear some of the strategies you guys talked about uh, here to apply it to, um, you know, he does something very similar to at least what I do. And, and yeah. um, you know, if you kind of talk to my listeners about what you talked about with them, we'd appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. I appreciate you having me. And yeah, so just for people, I've been in the business since 1997, started as a small remodeling contractor, uh, handyman, built that into a $30 million company, sold it, and then started getting into real estate development. So my entire career, I've been a builder, real estate developer. And then during that period of building that first company, uh, I started 12 other businesses and, and built them up and sold them off. So I like to do equity capital, buy companies, build them up, sell them off, or roll up fragmented companies like dental practices, you know, buy those up, put them in a platform and sell them. Um, and then the same thing with real estate. I love to do, you know, bigger projects, you know, heavy lift, uh, value add, um, adaptive reuse, and then ground up. So that's kind of how I'm wired fewer, bigger deals. So in addition to the coaching and mentoring, you know, I have deals going on in my region from North Carolina up into DC. That's kind of the region I've played in for the last 20 some years. Um, so, uh, so with Grant and what he does, it's a little bit different. So he does the fund strategy. So he has a reg A filing. So, you know, um, under, you know, the SEC guidelines, most people are doing a, uh, you know, 506B or a 506C, um, which is, you know, sophisticated investors in the B, uh, all accredited in the C. You can't advertise a B, you can advertise a C. Well, he does what's called a Reg A, which uh, you can advertise, and then everybody, you don't have to be accredited, uh, and then you can have investors as little as $5,000. So he's been very prolific with that, advertising on social media, marketing on social media to allow people the opportunity to invest, where, you know, somebody with five grand, you know, couldn't invest in an apartment syndication before, you know, or, you know, because they didn't make enough money. Now, under a Reg A, you can only invest 10% of your income. So if you make 100 grand a year, you can only invest 10,000. That's the most you can make. So there are some rules and parameters, but it does open the door up for less sophisticated, non-accredited investors to invest in funds. And then what Grant does is he'll go out and he'll buy the deal with his own money, and then he'll replace it with the fund money that he's raised which is called recapitalizing. So it's almost like a refinance, cash out refinance versus like what you guys do, a traditional syndication, you go find the property, you put together your SEC filing, and uh, then you go out and raise the capital for that deal. Uh, so that's you know how he started. Then he's just switched to the fund model a couple of years ago, just because it enabled him to buy bigger deals faster. So uh, what was really fascinating about Grant and, then, and guys like that, and then you know people uh, like me and what I've done in my career, you know, he started with one house, sold that, took the profits, bought, you know, a 34 unit building. Um, and well, actually from a rental side, it was just one rental house and he wasn't making any money, sold that, decided, you know what, single family homes aren't going to get me there quick. So he moved into multifamily, bought one, sold that, and moved into a portfolio, bought, and just kind of scaled it from there, all with his own money that he generated from his company because, he, you know, he had a sales training business. Um, and he kind of grew and scaled that and it's built it into what it is now, which is about 7,700 units, um, you know, somewhere around, you know, 1.7, 1.5 billion, something like that. Uh, in the whole scheme of multifamily, he's not even in the top 100. He's doing very well. And that's, you know, a lot of people are like, wow, you know, 7,700 units. But, you know, in the whole scheme of the multifamily world, there's much bigger players out there. And that's where he's trying to get, 
and he's working towards over the next couple of years. And, you know, of course, this put a little, you know, wrinkle in that, in that plan. So that's kind of how he operates and kind of the, you know, what he does and, um, you know, kind of what I help people do in terms of growing and scaling their businesses and starting from wherever they are, one property and going to wherever they want to go. And, you know, the real key to that whole thing is, you know, um, becoming that leader, delegator, motivator, right? So you've got to, you've got to develop yourself first and foremost as a leader. You've got to put those systems in place for raising capital, for sourcing and finding deals, for doing the due diligence, and then for closing those deals. So those are all systems, all processes that initially starts with just you and your partner, right? And as you grow and scale, you've got to put those pieces in place. You've got to find those aces and put them in the right place and coach them to success. And that's kind of what I've done my entire career in all my different businesses. So I wasn't actively running or managing any of those. I would find great, great leaders, good operators. I would put them in the right position and coach them to success. So as we grew and scaled, um, I'd never built a house before I, I built this building company. So what I did was I hired some really great people from the top building company in the area, brought them in and let them build my company for me. And I coached them to success. And the real mindset switch here in growing and scaling any business is, you know, you hear a lot of people say work, uh, on the business, not in the business, right? My mantra, my philosophy has always been you work on the people in the business, so they work on the business for you. So it's just a little different mindset where you start to realize, wait a minute, it's the people that's going to create scale, not the business itself. So you got to pour into those people, develop them, you know, lead them, coach them, but more importantly, you got to turn them loose and let them do their job and let them build the company for you uh, while you continue to focus on the big picture. Oh, and, that, and that makes a lot of sense. And that was going to be my question. How, you know, what almost what's the secret to success for someone to, and I know you've worked with various different entrepreneurs at various different stages of their career or business, you know, to kind of take them from nothing to, to something within a very short time period. And, and it sounds like the key is get your systems and get your people um, in place. Um, and like you said, don't work on your business, although you really should know the fundamentals um, and, and you still have somewhat of a success and, um, you know, understanding of what your, your product or service is, because um, mm -hmm. that's going to help you train other people um, or, or at least kind of delegate. Um, I guess, what would you say kind of, you kind of touched on it a little bit and, and for, you know, guys you talked about like, like Grant, you know, he, he grew in real estate. He had another business at the time, but, you know, in a very quick time period, um, yeah. it's almost like, like his, you know, the book 10 extra growth, it's, it's everything is, it seems nowadays been, you know, everything is sort of on a very fast track. So how, what's, what's kind of the key? I know you touched on it a little bit with the people, but can you kind of dive into that a little bit more? Yeah. So, you know, the key is number one, it starts with a vision, right? So you have to be that visionary first, you know, a visionary leader that inspires results out of others. So it starts with that. It starts with that vision and that idea. And, you know, Grant's like, man, I never thought I'd be here. I never thought I'd be doing this. So that kind of evolves and changes as you go along. And then, like you said, you, you know, you need to understand the business, know the numbers, know the metrics, you know, of the business, but you don't have to know everything because you can hire people and bring them in to handle the details at the higher levels and they can teach you and you learn from them. So one of the critical elements like what, what Grant, what he did, and again, blowing something up and growing and scaling means different things to different people. Um, you know, you don't have to just 10x everything. You can do whatever you want, where you want, as you go. And then once you get there, it's like railroad tracks, right? You stand on the tracks and you can only see so far and they kind of disappear. You walk to that point, you can see even further. So, you know, you want to have that vision of whatever it is first and that desire. And that's really where it starts. You got to really want it. You got to know what you want. You got to make up your mind, what it is you want to be, where it is you want to get. And then the getting there uh, takes care of itself. I mean, it just starts with that idea, that vision. And then you find key people. So for Grant, he'll tell you, one of his key hires um, is the, uh, the woman that runs his operation as the chief operating officer. Uh, he met her, you know, I don't know, was it, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. He's been in it 30 years. Um, and then she came on board. Um, she had a big corporate background and basically helped him build that operation as his chief operating officer. Same thing I did in my company, same thing I help other people do. You gotta find that key individual to bring on, to run the daily operations, that chief operating officer, you know, to handle the operational side, execute on the vision of the founders. Every great company, every great leader, every great founder 
has an executioner. They have an operations officer that handles the day to day and builds out that team. So that was the key for him. That was the key for me and pretty much everybody I work with. You got to get to a level. If you want to scale, if you want to grow, you got to find that individual to help you build that team. And can you kind of talk about that a little bit? So from, the, from a, you know, whether it's a, let's just say there's a company and they've had, you know, moderate, moderate very moderate growth, but they're still sort of new and emerging. Um, what would you say to whether they're in the real estate industry or, um, you know, a different industry, tech, doesn't matter, you know, on taking on, you know, kind of delegating and finding that, you know, COO or whatever it is to kind of, you know, put the glue together. Um, you know, what would you say to them? Like, like it's simply they don't have the revenue to pay for somebody like that or, or you know, they're scared to, um, you know, give equity out. Like, what would you, what would you kind of say to that? Because I have seen a lot of um, other companies, not, not in the real estate business, but I'm sure, sure in the real estate business too, where, you know, someone wants to come on and, um, you know, they're, they're having issues with the ask versus, um, you know, what, you know, they're, they're so hung up on the numbers when, yeah. you know, uh, like you said, it really could grow them. Uh, and uh, they're just seeing, and they're seeing, you know, I got to have this person on payroll. I got to pay benefits and this is the salary. Yeah. And like, that's all I'm looking at because there's, there's no, you know, revenue, at least at this point to offset it or um, to profit off of. So how do, how do you kind of get entrepreneurs over the hump of something like that? If they run into that situation, because I've seen it multiple times. Yeah, yeah. So you got to hire ahead of the growth, right? So you always want to be ahead of the growth with building your team, but you got to have the revenue to support it, right? So if you don't have the revenue, you know, you don't have the ability to do that. So first and foremost, focus on the revenue, whatever's making you money, focus 100% on that, grow it so you can bring that person into place and or find a way that this individual can come in and replace an expense somewhere else so that it offsets that income. So, and, and you don't have to hire that, that COO level right away. Okay. So you can hire somebody that maybe they're a director of, you know, uh, operations or director of something, or they're a general manager or, you know, something like that. And you don't want to give equity. So, you know, in your business, in your company, you know, that's not something you want to do right away. You know, maybe down the road, you might, you know, do whatever you want to do, stock options, whatever. But initially, this is a salaried employee. Their job is to build this company. You know, that's their role. You can put a bonus incentive plan in there. But there's a lot of great, talented, aggressive people out there that are looking for an opportunity to come on board with a company and help them grow. So you want to start them at a lower level and say, look, this is entry level. You're coming in. It's a ground floor opportunity. Maybe you're the general manager. Maybe you're the director of operations that could eventually lead to this position. So you want to find somebody who can come in and evaluate what you're doing and pay for themselves and then grow that company so that there's an ROI on that position. Uh, and then you can continue to build the team out. But at the end of the day, you know, you've got to have that income uh, and, and you've got to have the ability to, you know, recruit, hire, train, lead, motivate, delegate to that individual. So it starts at the, at the basic level, you know, from an administrative standpoint. So to ease into your hiring and ease into building that team, some people you don't necessarily need that superstar right away. You just need somebody on the administrative level. So a lot of companies, the first person I find for them, literally, if it's, you know, owner, operator, one person doing everything or two, you know, partners doing everything, you know, like you guys, first thing you need is an administrative assistant to take all of that load off of you. And then there's systems as well that can help with that. So that's the first step, that administrator. They can do everything. You know, they help you with your social media, your marketing, your investor relations, your, you know, closing documents, your transactional stuff, whatever it is administratively that keeps you from focusing on the big picture which is finding more assets and raising more capital. That's what's going to grow your and scale your company. Um, you have that person. And then as the income increases, then you can step up the level or you bring somebody in who can be that person that's willing to do the administrative stuff ahead of the game. And then you bring on an administrator later. So if you find somebody who can be a COO level or a director of operations and say, look, right now you got to wear all the hats. You got to be the bookkeeper. You got to be the administrative assistant. You got to be, you know, the acquisitions, you got to be investor relations, you got to be marketing, I need you to do everything right now. And then as we grow this company, then we can fill in those pieces. So if you're paying somebody third party to do marketing, maybe that can be brought in house by having this person, you know, posting this, that, whatever, you know, so that's another way to kind of offset the cost of bringing somebody in on the front end. Got it. That makes sense. So how do you um, coach entrepreneurs that are at that level? 
And there are a lot of them that are at that level that can afford to take somebody on to lessen the burden in whatever mechanism uh, you describe. How do you, you know, kind of get them over the hump to, because uh, I, I see a lot of entrepreneurs when um, they bring somebody on, they're scared and they're scared mm -hmm. of them not doing the job that you were doing before right. because they don't have, like you said, you don't want to give out equity. They don't have equity. They're not going to focus on what, you know, should be done 150% like you are. Um, how do you kind of coach entrepreneurs to get over that, that fear and that bump in the road to it's okay to delegate because mm -hmm. if you that's the only way to grow in my opinion. It is. So the first step is, do you want to grow? I mean, where do you really want to be? So you got to make up your mind. Who are you? How are you wired? And is this in your DNA? Because some people just can't let go of control and can never, they just can't do it. So you got to decide first and foremost, can I? Am I willing to do that? Uh, and really what that means is, number one, understanding nobody's going to do it exactly like you. Everybody's got sort of their own thing. Nobody's going to deliver the results exactly like you, but people will perform and they will deliver uh, and they will do a good job, but it's never going to be exactly like you would do it at certain levels. You know, then there will be levels, you know, where I was very fortunate. I came in, you know, so let me back up a bit. Really what you want to do is you want to have hire people that are smarter, better, and more talented than you. So a lot of it goes back to ego. There's a lot of entrepreneurs that are threatened by people that are smarter or better than them. And, you know, that's what you should be looking for, number one. You want to, you want to find people that you can learn from that are going to help you, that have been doing what it is you're, you're wanting to do and have been where you're trying to get to and bring them on board to help you build this. So that's number one. Don't be afraid to hire somebody who's way more competent than you, way more smarter and better. That's what you're looking for. So that's one big roadblock. The other one is to realize they're going to make mistakes. They're not going to do things exactly the way you would do it. But as long as they're doing things um, within the guidelines and the culture uh, of the company and, you know, within your values and framework and you get the result you're looking for, it really doesn't matter how exactly they do it, as long as they get there. And then that comes back to the leader. So that's where we talked about developing. First thing I do with entrepreneurs is develop them as leaders, leaders, motivators, delegators. So a lot of people just aren't leaders and they don't understand leadership. So leadership first and foremost understands that it all stops with you, right? So normally there's this pyramid, you know, all the executive CEOs up here, everybody else is down below in that organization. So I flipped that pyramid upside down. The leader is at the bottom of that stack. It's the leader's job to give everybody everything they need in that organization, the tools, training, systems, and support to be successful. But the most important thing is that clear direction and no uncertain terms, exactly what's expected and when. And then you measure that performance and you hold them accountable to the goal that was set. So where people fail in organizations and leadership is that they bring people on and they put them in a position and they never give them that clear direction, exactly what they're supposed to do and when, and then measure that performance and provide the feedback, right? Feedback is the breakfast of champions, okay? You know, your partner was an NFL player, you know, and that, that was the number one role of the coach, not only to train these guys and lead them and motivate them and delegate them, but give that feedback. You know, man, you ran that route, you know, if you'd have just cut right here a little bit sooner, the pass would have been there and boom, you know, and they, they review that film on Monday. Why did they review that film on Monday? Feedback. Feedback is the breakfast of champions, man. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So you got to have that clear direction. You got to have those goal setting sessions. You got to have that feedback to let people know where they stand and then hold them accountable. And what holding accountable means is, you know, hey, we, we needed this underwriting done by Friday. You had the whole week, you know, in order to move forward and make a decision. We didn't get that done. What happened? And then you let them explain. But the direct, the clear direction was laid out. You know, hey, Anthony, I need this deal fully underwritten by Friday so we can decide whether or not we're going to move forward, um, you know, go get it. So, you know, hopefully they have that system in place of how they do that underwriting, right? Gathering the due diligence, getting all the, you know, information and documents and all that to make the assumptions. So you want to make sure that's a system in place that's already been clearly laid out. So they know exactly what's expected and when. And then when you got to come back in and you got to hold them accountable to that, what happens a lot of times is uh, leaders will delegate a task and they never follow up and follow through. So what that tells your team is what you say is really not that important, right? So whatever is important to you will be important to them. You know, you, you've got to make sure that people understand what their contribution means to the company. So when I come in on Friday and you're, and you know, and more importantly, a leader inspires results. So you're going to come to me because I'm the kind of leader that's going to reward you at a very personal, intimate level 
for producing good results. You got to show them what good results look like and you've got to reward good results, right? So you're going to probably come to me Thursday afternoon or Friday morning. Hey, Greg, I got this done, man. Here's the underwriting. Here's what I think. And I'm going to say, Anthony, and that's fantastic. I asked you to have this done by Friday so we can decide whether we are going to move forward with this deal. That's what's going to keep this company growing. That's what's going to make the difference between a great company and just your average company out there, man. You did an awesome job. Thank you so much. I really needed this. And you, you know, and, and you just sincerely appreciate what they've done and let them know what it did for the company. Now, if I have to come to you on Friday afternoon and, hey, Anthony, do you have that underwriting done? Ah, you know, I didn't get that done. I didn't really get a chance. To, so I'm going to sit down and I'm going to say, why not? And then I'm going to hear your reasoning, whatever that is. And I'm going to say, you know, I'm really disappointed. In order for this company to grow, in order for you to grow, in order for you to get to the next level, for us to be a great company, you know, if we have deadlines, we have got to hit them. We have to do whatever it takes, morally, legally, and ethically within our limits, and get this stuff done. This is going to really hold us back. We're not going to be able to reach our goal. Now we have to table this till Monday. It's really going to set us back. You know, so same thing. Now that's a one-on-one -on -one private conversation with nobody else around. Uh, whereas the other one you want to do in front of everybody else. Okay. You reward good performance in front of everybody, redirect poor performance alone. And then at the end of that conversation, you say, you know, Anthony, I know that you want to do a great job. I know that you're doing your best. So whatever it was that tripped you up, let's figure out how we can fix that so this doesn't happen again. And then now you're, you know that it's not personal. Okay, there might have been a glitch in the system. And the first thing you look at, if you didn't get that done, why? Did I not give you everything you needed to get that done? Did you have the tools, training systems, and support to be successful with that, with that outcome? And did I give you the clear direction? Was everything there that you needed? So I got to look at that first and foremost. So if I'm not getting the result I'm looking for, then I need to go take a look at why that happened and then address that. And if they did have everything and they just didn't get it done, then you've got to analyze the individual because you'll have a won't do or you'll have a can't do. That's really the only two things you're going to end up with. And if you have a won't do, there's nothing you can do with that. All right. You should have never hired them in the first place. You just got to get rid of them or they're in the wrong position. Maybe they're not the right. They're not analysts. Maybe they're great at acquisitions or, or you know, investor relations, or maybe they're great at, you know, dealing with brokers or whatever, but they're not analysts. They're not underwriters. So you might have the wrong person in the wrong job. So first and foremost, you got to make sure you hire the right people, put them in the right position so that they can thrive. Aces in places. You want your best people in the best place. If Tom Brady's, you know, on your team in Tampa Bay just hired Tom Brady, they're not going to put him at wide receiver. What are they going to do? They're going to put him at quarterback. And more importantly, what are they going to do? You know how to win Super Bowls. Go win a Super Bowl. You think they're going to micromanage Tom and tell him, dude, you should only take two steps before you pass. Uh-uh. They're going to say, dude, win a Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of in a nutshell how that works. That's right. And he, so you touched on a lot of things. Um, the, the one key point that kind of stuck out to me was positive feedback and negative feedback, sort of negative feedback. Um, yeah. But at, in a diff the way you framed the conversation with the potential employee, I mean, it was, that was perfect. How do you, for a lot of entrepreneurs, including myself, are thinking, how do you keep that person? Is that the way to keep that person motivated to help grow the company alongside you along the way? If, yeah, if so they you, do, yeah, okay. Yeah, so you have to be sincerely interested in other people first. So you have to be sincerely interested in their success first and foremost. And it's always about, so the result's always about the behavior, not the individual. But, you know, People who feel good about themselves are going to produce the best results. So you have to, you have to, you know, make them a part of the team. Let them know how valuable they are. You have to recognize that on a regular behavior. And that really changes to where you want to recognize good performance in public regularly to where it becomes an automatic habit, not in a manipulative way, but a very sincere way and at the smallest levels and let them solve their own problems. That's really it. So the last thing you want is somebody coming in your office or, you know, hitting you up all the time for every little thing. What you want to do is you want to encourage them to solve their own problems by asking them questions. So that way they feel like they're part of the team. They feel like they can do their job. They can thrive. They can make decisions and, and get to that. So, yeah, that, that's a great point. It's first and foremost about making them feel good about themselves, what they do, and the contribution that they're making with the company. The worst thing in the world, you can pay people – as much money as you want, but if they don't feel appreciated, sincerely appreciated, and fully understand the impact that their actions have on the company in a positive and negative way, it doesn't matter how much you pay. 
I agree. I agree. I, I have actually experience with that. So yeah. um, makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, kind of winding down a little bit, because that was a lot in, a lot in this yeah. episode, which is really good. Um, you know, I guess kind of closing arguments here, you know, where, I guess if someone's just trying to start a business, let's say it is mm -hmm. on the real estate sponsor side, I guess, like you said, we're, they start with the vision, mission, et cetera. Um, you know, do you still recommend that they do all the work? And obviously you got to get, you got to get revenue. So mm -hmm. until how, however long it takes to take on that next hire and to kind of, like you said, you know, grow along, you know, grow alongside them. Is, is that what you would recommend for a new, a new, like a brand new startup? you know, company, it, it, specifically in the real estate sponsorship. Yeah, yeah. So it depends on what your resources are. So yeah, you have to start from where you are. So you don't want to let this, you know, stop. So man, I can't do this unless I have all these pieces. No, just get started. Just get it going and do whatever you have to do to get this thing running, to get it going, and then find ways and change the mindset from, you know, a lot of people have the mindset, man, I can't afford that, you know, in my business, in my life, you know, I can't afford that. I can't do this. What you want to do is reframe that conversation how can I afford it? How can I do this? So what do I need to do in my business, in my life, in order for this to happen and to bring somebody on to help us go? But yeah, ultimately to grow, you've got to get to a point where you take that leap, bring that individual on, but you got to have the revenues, right? So you want to, you've got to build the company to a point to where you've got some kind of revenue and or resources to pay that individual, you know, to go ahead and bring them on. Makes a lot of sense. Awesome. And Winding down this podcast, uh, we usually ask three questions at the end of each show. Uh, first question would be, well, we mentioned a couple of books, what would be your favorite you know, business book or leadership or you know, even real estate book that you've read in your lifetime? You know, one of, the, one of the best business books I've ever read was Managing by Harold Janine. That's a very old book. Harold Janine was the uh, CEO of ITT, which, um, uh, or yeah, it was ITT, I can't remember now, but uh, multi-conglomerate. Um, corporation and uh, back in the you know 70s 80s and built that company into a huge multi conglomerate owned all kinds of stuff outstanding book about leading delegating motivating holding meetings growing a, uh, a multi-divisional company so that that was a fantastic book and then you know I love reading books about people who have achieved great things so you know the the you know Tillman Fertitta's Marcus Limonis um, you know Donald Trump's books um, uh, you know Ray Dalio you know, billionaires who have achieved, you know, a lot of success and even people at the hundreds of millions of dollar levels. I love to read their story, how they built their companies, what they did, the risks they took, things like that. Awesome. And outside of all of this, what are some of your hobbies? Yeah, I've been a lifelong surfer. You know, a lot of people look at me, you're a surfer. So yeah, I've been surfing my entire life and, um, you know, grew up doing that. I love fishing um, and I love skiing. Awesome. And uh, if you had a number one role model, whether it's personally or professionally, who would it be or multiple? Yeah, yeah. So I have a strong faith. So obviously, you know, um, my faith's important to me. So, you know, from a biblical standpoint, uh, you have all of those, you know, Proverbs is probably the best business book ever written. Um, but, you know, as far as, you know, role models and uh, who I look up to, you know, there's, there's so many great leaders in business you can look back on, like Harold Janine was one of them. Uh, you know, Lee Iacocca is another one, you know, in terms of, of business, Steve Jobs, you know, not as a person, but what he's done, you know, Bill Gates, you know, especially right now with, with what he's doing, what he's done, Warren Buffett. So, you know, all of the great business people, um, you know, over the years, but I'll go back to where it all started for me. You know, I read, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad with Robert Kiyosaki. What I got from that book was build businesses that generate cash flow to then invest in other assets. A lot of people get real estate. I didn't get real estate out of that. I got the other way around. So that was first. Then it was um, The Power of Positive Thinking by uh, Norman Vincent Peale. And I applied what I learned. I read that book and I said, I am going to buy in, embrace my faith and believe this and go and believe in myself. You know, the whole premises of that book is nothing can stop somebody who believes, right? So everything is possible for, for he who believes. That's what that book is built on. And then um, uh, Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. So those were the three most fundamental books that I read that launched my career um, and, and, you know, as people to look up to. That is awesome. 
Um, we'll have all those lists of books and everything Greg mentioned in the comments of the, the podcast. How can people find you, Greg? Oh, so uh, gregdickerson.com, uh, my website. So I've got a YouTube channel podcast where I share content and advice and information. Uh, it's all on there, gregdickerson.com. And, uh, you know, check it out. A lot of great stuff. Awesome. We'll definitely have that in the comments as well. Uh, thank you so much again, Greg, for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Again, uh, my name is Anthony Scandariato with Red Knight Properties. I'm your host and hope to see you next time. Thanks again, Greg. Hey, Anthony. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Awesome.